Welcome to another episode of The Mentor Project. I am so honored and excited to have an unbelievable person on today's show. It is just with, again, I'm so honored to have Jennifer, also known as JJ, and Jen Snow. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Susan. I am so delighted to be here. A big fan of uh, what you've been working on, and I'm really excited to chat with you today. And let me tell everyone who you are. And I know that there are so many kids and adults that are going to be so inspired by your story, and they are going to really learn about some things that I think they may not even know exists. So I'm I'm just so excited. Um, so JJ Snow. You are the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Air Force, also referred to as AFWORKS, and that's, that's an innovation team, and that's you right. serve, yeah, you serve as the military representative for technology outreach and engagement. You bridge the gap between government and various technology communities to improve collaboration and communications. You identify smart solutions to wicked problems and guide the development of future technology strategy to benefit the U.S. Air Force, Department of Defense, interagency, and allied partners. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that is a lot. And so we're going to have to learn about what actually all that means, as well as you are the COO of the Mentor Project. I am. I am. And I absolutely love that role, too. I'm really excited to talk about all of this. So before we get into your role in the Mentor Project, I would love for you to talk about your journey into getting into the military, because it's really uh, an amazing story. And I know that a lot of people don't even know that there are so many opportunities like this in the military. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, I got to say, I was just so impressed with the Air Force when I started to look at the available opportunities they had. Prior to joining the Air Force, I was actually a park ranger and a wildland firefighter with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, which I absolutely loved. But I felt like I was ready to do more. I wanted a challenge. And the Air Force offered that. Um, they have so many different amazing opportunities. When I went in and I took a look at uh, the options, a lot to choose from. I could have been a pilot. I could have been a scientist. I could have been a security forces member. I could have been somebody working in space. Uh, just the sky was a limit. And the really cool thing about the Air Force is there's no limit as far as what you can do as a woman. Every single job that I've had, unless I show that for some reason I'm not able to do it, my leadership has always enabled me to be successful and to do whatever I put my mind to. And that is an amazing, beautiful thing. And, you know, I think that's such a great point because there are so many stereotypes about women really not having opportunity in the military. And that's from people that are the outside that don't know. And I know that yeah. there's a lot of girls, young women out there that really don't even think about the opportunities that exist. So how did you decide with all of those different uh, you know, aspects that you, and options that you could have had, how, what was your, uh, your journey in terms of making that decision? So I've always been passionate about technology and really passionate about technology making a difference for society. Uh, so when I learned that there was an opportunity to get involved in technology solutions, plus counterproliferation work, that was my passion. Um, I instantly gravitated towards that, that focus area. That was a, a big deal for me because, well, when I was a kid growing up, I still remember getting under desks in New Jersey uh, doing the, the last of the nuclear drills. And it really makes you think, you know, what's this all about? And so um, I've always been a science geek. I love science fact and science fiction from when I was little. And as I grew older, I realized this was a big problem. I wanted to do something about it. And so the Air Force afforded me the opportunity to do that. And I spent most of my time working with special operations um, focused on how do we make sure that bad people don't do bad things with chem, bio, or nuclear uh, devices. And so that then led to a very cool opportunity to go to the Naval Postgraduate School where I was invited to look at different technologies. 
and Department of Energy had a project and they said, look, we'd like you to take a look at this cool new tech called additive manufacturing, 3D printing. And I said, okay, um, awesome. What do you want me to do? And they said, tell us how it's going to impact society. And that led into a project that turned into my thesis work on radical leveling technologies, which was later briefed at the White House and resulted in me moving over to become an innovation officer, which is the job I'm doing now. And it's absolutely I want to just, I want to just, because you know what all this means, but I know that our audience and I don't even know what it means. Go back to what you just said. You said radical leveling. leveling. Could you talk a little bit more about radical leveling technology? Definitely. So this is a class of fast moving technologies that we weren't really tracking because the technologies were changing in such a way that um, they were impacting multiple areas of society very fast, all at the same time, and creating revolutionary or evolutionary changes uh, in in ways that we hadn't seen before. Think about the cell phone. When you look at a cell phone, it pretty much has been the same form factor from the first one. I mean, it it went from a, a large brick down to a very little flip phone to the smartphones we have today. But really, there wasn't a whole lot that changed about that. When you encounter something like radical leveling technologies, a lot of things change very fast. And in fact, most of these technologies are outcompeting older technologies. In the case of additive manufacturing, that means you have 3D printing coming into spaces where uh, computer-controlled machines, CNC machines, would typically be used and they would create projects over a series of weeks to months that now we can create on a single device using multiple materials in a matter of hours. That's revolutionary. That changes how we manufacture. It changes our ability to use different materials for the future. And in some cases, it was actually putting certain businesses out of work and replacing them entirely. We wanted to understand what this looked like across a number of different technologies, everything from human performance enhancement to high performance computing and quantum computing, uh, looking at at things like um, nanomaterials, And how, when you combine those in interesting ways with 3D printing, you now have self-assembling materials that respond to light or heat uh, or fluid. And when you drop them in, maybe they're flat. And then all of a sudden they turn into this really cool lattice work when they're wet or exposed to sunlight. And when you take them back out again, they go flat, which means you can carry things. They're stronger, they're lighter. They can do things that other materials can't do. And these were the types of interactions and and competitive capabilities we got really excited about. So it sounds like you and your team on a day-to-day basis really do some interesting experiments and things, and you're doing really interesting things. So for, um, I know folks would want to probably know a little bit more about the day-to-day work, right? So could you, and I think you just started talking about that a little bit, but like, so if the person that's working on your team, what are they doing day-to-day? Oh my gosh, we've got an amazing team. Uh, I am incredibly proud to be part of and humbled to be part of the AFWorks team. Um, Everybody on there is really passionate about making a positive difference. And um, you can see the impact that we're having daily, not just for the Air Force, but the entire Department of Defense. So uh, the current role that I'm in is really focused on scouting and vetting those technologies that are going to solve a problem for the Air Force, the Department of Defense, or any of our interagency partners or our allied partners. That includes Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And in a lot of cases, we're looking at solutions that we can all use together because they're interoperable. If they work together, then that means when we come together on a crisis or disaster response, everything will work better and we can build bigger networks to get things done faster. I also am focused on how to build engagement networks out. And this is really important because none of what our team does is done in a vacuum. We have to have outside perspectives coming in. None of us sit in say quantum uh, annealing computer capabilities. That's a very narrow niche around quantum uh, capabilities that are developing today. But I have people, experts that I know that sit in that space that can advise us on This is what this tech can do today, and this is what it can't do, and here's what it can do in 18 months. Um, We also engage with a number of hackers, and the hacker teams that are out there are fantastic. They have come on board and helped us incredibly, 
across so many different areas. I'll give you one example. This one is fantastic. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, we had a project that we pulled together, all open source hardware and tech that we sent over to Iraq. And it was being used to advise the Iraqi government and specifically Iraqi forces as they began to take back control of their country. The challenge was we knew there were vulnerabilities, but we didn't know where all of them were. So we reached out to this hacker network that we had set up and we said, look, can you please take a look and, and tell us where the vulnerabilities exist uh, and what we could do about them? 48 hours, we had seven hackers come back, identify all of the vulnerabilities and tell us all of the ways to harden it so we could get it back overseas to the Iraqis in a week. And they did it all for free as volunteers. Wow, that is amazing. So you took people that are already doing things, maybe not for good, and then you switched it and you said, okay, look, you've got the skill. You might not be channeling, channeling it in the best way, but we're going to have oh, you no. channel your, your, no? No, be, no, no. So uh, let me explain. That's another, okay. that's, that's also important, Susan, and thank you for right. that up. There's a very important distinction that often doesn't happen in the media concerning hackers. Everybody kind of lumps them into one pot. That's not true. The hackers that we're working with, and we've got about 700 of them now that team regularly with the government, are what are called white hat hackers. These mean they are, this, these are ethical hackers that focus on identifying vulnerabilities and problems and then finding fixes and sharing them, whether that's to the government or that's to an interagency partner, that's to a university or a hospital. Um, there's an amazing initiative right now called the Cyber Threat Intelligence League. 1,400 volunteers across 70 countries and 22 time zones. These are all white hat hackers that have decided that they're going to invest their time helping to protect critical infrastructure, helping to protect government facilities, hospitals, Wi-Fi enabled medical devices, and they chose to do this on their own time to make a positive difference. These are the same people that we're working with now across the government, and they're absolutely amazing. So I, I want to wave off the, the black hat um, moniker that gets attached to them a lot, of, a lot of times and emphasize that these are white hat ethical hackers that are out there to do good. Think of them as uh, the Lone Ranger, right? Right. They hide in when we need the help because they've got the expertise and they sit in those cyber spaces on a daily basis and can best advise us on how to fix things. I can't resist, though, making a comment, um, given particularly the context of the day and the time that we're living in today, is that right. I think that we need to pay attention to changing the words of black and white hackers. Oh, I agree. White is being associated with good and black is being associated with not. And I'm just really aware of that. And so yes. my recommendation will be like, let's, let's change those terms, right? So that we have a different color uh, association. I, I love that. I, I couldn't love resist. That. I'm sorry. Yes. You know? No, I, I, and you're exactly right. Um, so maybe what the, a better term would be ethical hackers and then First, right. serious hackers. I think that would be a better set of terms to use. Just say that again, because I think you got cut off. So you would say, uh, ethical, say it again. ethical hackers, and then let's call the other group either malicious or nefarious hackers. Perfect. Great. That, that sounds like a uh, more responsible way and, and really more reflective way of uh, entitling something. So I agree. Great. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting because to a novice, to somebody on the outside, when we hear the term hacker, it is associated for many of us with somebody who isn't. So I'm so glad we had the opportunity to really clarify that. And so to neutralize the term hackers, it's not actually the hacker, it's what they're actually doing. So that's, right. that's, that's great. That's great. You know, one of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed with so much of what you do, but one of the Thank things you. that I've, I've read about you that really impressed me um, was your belief and the way that you operate is that you don't focus on who's getting it right or who is making it work and who's finding the solution. You, what I've read about you is that you really have this belief that, you know, it doesn't matter. We're all in this together. And what matters is that we solve the problem. And that's, you know, in, in today's world, in, uh, it, that's just so refreshing and also so important. And I'd love for you to speak about that. 
Yeah, and that, that's, um, thank you for asking because this is something that really matters and, and it's, um, it's really core to the innovation mission that I'm seeing both at AFWorks, but also across a number of other innovation initiatives in the government. Many of the innovators that you'll find in these spaces are really focused on how can we make a positive difference that benefits everybody and not just the military or not just government, but whole of society. Um, and they don't want their name attached. They don't care about the credit. It's really about how can we best help to make a positive difference, to move things further, faster for everybody. Um, and you'll see this time and again. There aren't a lot of egos in this space because the people operating this space, we don't have time for egos. We have time to solve problems. That's what we're passionate about. And we want to make that difference. And we want to make it in such a way that it's shareable to everybody. Um, in fact, one of the, the ultimate goals, my personal ultimate goal, uh, after having been to, deployed uh, and over to Afghanistan and Iraq, is wouldn't it be amazing if we can actually layer the technology in such a way to drive our leadership towards diplomatic decisions and away from conflict and crisis decisions? I think we could do this, and I think we could do it globally, and how amazing would that be if we didn't have to go to war again in the future? Oh. Absolutely. And I wonder if that value that you have is really what has contributed to your success. Uh, it may be in part, but I have to say that I have been successful because I've been really fortunate to have some amazing mentors and amazing teammates who have worked alongside me, um, who have uh, bolstered me and pushed me and challenged me and helped me to grow as a person. Um, and I've got to give credit there because it's, none of us get ahead by ourselves. It's always a community. And um, I've been really fortunate to have some amazing people that have been there throughout my life to get me to where I am today. So now I can do the same for others and I can also start making a bigger difference on a global scale. That's beautiful. Could you talk about who have been some of your mentors specifically? Oh gosh, yes, of course, of course. Um, so one of my, my near and dear friends is uh, Toby Redshaw. He is absolutely fantastic. I've known Toby for about seven years, eight years now. Um, he is uh, one of those guys who has, uh, he lives like um, an Ernest Hemingway type lifestyle. He'll laugh if he hears this. But he has, I met him at Department of Energy. Uh, he was working on a project with us there uh, around strategic latency. And the strategic latency project is looking at how technology impacts society and government and the military in particular. And uh, we started talking. And at the time he was uh, doing consulting, he's now working for one of the telecommunications companies. And we just really hit it off. And Toby has always challenged me. And he's always introduced me to other people that have challenged me. And he constantly invites me out to different um, situations where we're going into a, a conference and we're going to have a talk. In fact, last year we had an amazing talk um, looking at technology and teaming with government at the Aspen Institute. And um, Toby was the moderator of the panel, and we just had some fantastic discussions that I think really um, allowed people to feel connected to the government in ways that they hadn't been, been before because we pushed the envelope. We got out there and we had a discussion that built bridges. Um, we were allowing people to ask tough questions listening and acknowledging what they were saying and then responding with here's how we're addressing that or here's how we can work that together. Um, Toby taught me that. He is epic at building teams. He's epic at leading teams. And um, he has always been somebody that I've turned to for a lot of advice across my career. Um, that's, that's great. And it sounds like one of the themes in that and what he was doing was really bringing people together. And the, the belief is and the value is that if we unite instead of divide, but unite on issues and problems, technology, then we can move society forward and we all benefit. You know, and, right. I, and I loved what you said before in terms of, um, you know, imagine that we can do it peacefully and not use war. And, and we need, obviously, we, we won't go into politics right now, but we certainly need more of that. So that is absolutely wonderful. And I think this brings us a little bit uh, to talk about the Mentor Project. And as you were talking about Toby, I was thinking, um, what would you say are some of the important things that people 
that are listening to this and watching this should look out for when they're choosing someone to be their mentor or thinking about choosing a mentor? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, so whenever I'm looking for somebody to mentor me, the first thing I do is I learn a lot as much as I can about them. Um, I find out if, you know, they're an expert in an area that I'm trying to learn about. Um, are they accessible? Do we have shared values? That's really important to the discussion. I know what my personal goals and values are and where I want to go in life. I want to make sure that the person that I'm talking to and asking to be my mentor also shares those similar goals and values. Um, they have to be, you know, somebody that's accessible, that's willing to, to be a, um, a mentor. And usually there's somebody that um, I look up to that, that I've seen out there making a positive difference. They're, they're, um, we term it quiet professionals. They are active in their community. They're always seeking a way to make a positive difference. Um, they don't uh, shout it out. Uh, and it's something that you might quietly find out about or not at all that they're out there doing these little things in addition to their regular job. And those are the kinds of people that um, I tend to gravitate towards because they challenge me, they push me to be a better person. I would say if you're looking for a mentor, find somebody that aligns with your values and somebody that you admire and respect. Learn as much as you can about them and then don't hesitate to find an email and contact them or pick up a phone and ask for some time on their schedule. You would be surprised at how many people are willing to sit down and talk and mentor you just because other people have done that for them. Um, and I would encourage everybody, don't be shy about it. This is how we learn. This is how we grow. And there's an amazing community of people out there that want to do this for you. That's, that's at the heart of the Mentor Project. That's exactly why we have so many amazing people joining because they're passionate about mentoring. They're passionate about giving back. And somebody had done that for them first. And before we get into your role at the Mentor Project and how you, you became involved, I just want to underscore what you said about when you look for a mentor is that you focus on what their, your shared values are. Because so many times, especially in our society where success, and I put that in quotes, is defined by the award or by the, where the, your picture becomes, you know, is, is, it on the top, is it on the cover of a magazine, or did they get this award or that award? And, and that's, that's nice, but that's not, that might not be who you want to choose to be your mentor, because sometimes it might all be about that person, and they might not be willing to actually try to help you and believe in the uh, value of helping others. And so you really want to go underneath. And I just really wanted to underscore that because again, it's tied to the way in which people define success. Which it's so, it's so important, Susan, if I can, I, this is, a, I, I make a comment because there are two, two quick stories that I'll share on this. Um, first and foremost, one of the big things that um, I, I had a uh, Colonel Song Yu, who was another mentor of mine uh, when I was at the 70th Intel Surveillance and Reconnaissance Wing. Uh, I worked as his director of operations. Um, he always said, and I, I never forgot this, he said, that's great that you got that award. That was for work done yesterday. What are you going to do tomorrow? Don't look backwards, look forwards. And so I always carried that with me. And then when I was a brand new, shiny second lieutenant, um, one of the, the generals, General Hester, who ran AFSOC, uh, spoke to us during a mentoring session. Uh, and that's Air Force Special Operations Command. Um, and he said to all of the new lieutenants, he said, look, I, I've given you additional duties. You know, I know you, you are doing additional duties around the building. In my case, it was I cleaned the ladies' room every week. And it was gorgeous. And trash was taken out. Everything was clean. And his comment to all of us before giving us our assignments, because he had looked at us across the board as the whole person concept, how do you perform in all duties that you do? If you whined and complained and you didn't do due diligence on everything he gave you, the quote that I'll never forget that he said right before we were finding out our next assignments where we were getting ready to go was this. If I can't trust you in the little things, how can I possibly t trust you with a multi-million dollar aircraft or somebody's life uh, or a much bigger decision that could determine, you know, what we do? Do we go into a war? Do we not? That, that, gave, that gave me the chills. 
that gave me the chill. Repeat it because I think that is just words of such wisdom, pearls of wisdom. Repeat it again. He said, if I can't trust you with the little things, how can I possibly trust you with something as big as a multi-million dollar aircraft or somebody's life or to inform me on a decision that could lead our country into war? What an important message. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think that young people, older people also need to hear that and remember that. And again, because of so much that's happening in society, we forget that and people just want to do the important things. And you know, it reminds me of when I started doing media work, I would carry around the camera. I already had my PhD, but yet, you know, I was learning a new skill and I wanted to help other people. So for a while and working on other people's shows, that's what I did. I just carried the camera for them. And, and that right. is really important because the way you do some things is the one thing is the way you do everything, right? That's exactly right. And even when nobody is looking, because here's the thing, you know, and that still reflects because when you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, you know what you did or you didn't do, and you know if you did it right or not. So that's important because that also allows you to reflect on yourself as a person. And is that the person you want to get up and see in the mirror every morning? Wonderful, wonderful. So now we really know why you're the COO of The Mentor Project. So let's talk about how you got involved in that. Oh my goodness. So I was introduced to Debbie uh, through uh, Robert Cousins. Bob is another dear friend and mentor of mine. Um, I love him and his wife, Ellen. They are fantastic people. And they kept telling me, look, there's this mentor project. There's this mentor project. You need to check it out. I really want you to get involved. And I was busy. And and this went on for about a year. And uh, Bob finally convinced me, this was uh, last Christmas. He said, I really want you to talk to Debbie. She's amazing. You're going to hit it off. And so we talked and he was exactly right. Um, and she started to tell me what they were pulling together. I was so excited for this. Um, There are so many people out there, uh, kids out there, that are looking for opportunities to interface with mentors, and if we just get them the right person at the right time, that can spark them to do incredible things. And so when Debbie showed me, you know, here are who we have on, the people we have on board as mentors right now, um, this is how we'd like to grow it out. I said, yes, count me in. I want to help. All volunteers, everybody's donating their time. Um, It blew me away. And, you know, this is a natural part of um, what we do in the Air Force as well, is we mentor. You're expected to mentor um, several of your peers. You're expected to provide feedback. You're expected to mentor the people that you're supervising as well. Because how do we grow? We share the lessons that we've learned. We share the experiences that we've had. We share what other mentors have passed down to us. That's important. That matters. And especially now, that really, really matters. Because we have to be able to have those tools to move forward, and all of us are better together than each of us independently. Yeah. And it's so important because if I could just add, now that I've become involved in the mentor project, it's been a real honor. Um, and, 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 you know, being able to give this opportunity to people, to young people that wouldn't have it otherwise. There are a lot of people that have connections whose families are already connected to people who can mentor them but there is a whole population of folks that don't have that access and through no fault of their own or their families, they just, if they're just not in that world. And That's so right. for me, it's just absolutely wonderful having the opportunity to be working with uh, a, a movement. I call it, a, I like to call it a movement, a movement that's really getting information out to folks that would not normally have this information. And what I'm always excited about is, and for everybody listening out there, you can go on and you can actually ask a mentor. So anybody that you see whose information that you you, you are interested in what they're doing or you want to learn more, you can actually ask any of the mentors that are on the site uh, a question. And that for me is just, is priceless, right? I mean, I, I think to when I was younger, I didn't have access to people like this. And it would would have just been amazing. And it's amazing for me now. (laughs) I know what you mean. I've just been so impressed by um, the people that have volunteered their time and volunteered their passion to come on board and make a difference for others. Um, You know, they, they, they are willing to spend time, hours mentoring kids that are passionate on topics that they have experience in. 
Um, they're willing to go into the classroom and share their enthusiasm on different topics. Um, they're willing to take time to do a podcast or to come on a show with you, Dr. Susan, and talk about why they're passionate and how they got to where they are. And all of this matters because you never know when you say something that's going to inspire somebody else to finally step out and make a difference that could be that, that one ripple, that one ripple in the pond that changes everything for everybody in a really awesome way. Right. But for the mentoring project. Right. And not just for the person that like, there might be somebody out there right now that's listening and they be like, wow, they're really interested in doing what you do or something else. But it's not just about them. Yes. It's great that it's affording them the opportunity to learn, but what they're going to contribute to the world is just right. an amazing, amazing opportunity. So, and, yeah. and I love that we're global with this initiative. I'm so excited that we have people joining us from around the world to mentor. I'm super passionate about reaching out to African innovators. The different African innovation centers that I am seeing right now, the people that I'm talking to in places like Burkina Faso, in Ghana, in South Africa, in Tanzania, amazing what they're doing. Um, we need to highlight these innovators. We need to showcase what they're doing and we need to lift them up because if we lift them up, they can lift up the entire continent. And wouldn't that be amazing? That would be, I'm super passionate about this. So this is something that, you know, once I, I do retire from the military in the future, I am going to be focusing on this. How do we team up more closely with African innovators? How do we lift them up and how do we help make a difference there and then also bring them here? How can we start doing smart exchanges um, and showcasing and sharing the different technologies and developments that we're doing? That gets me excited. That's great. And I was just thinking of a couple of people that after this call, I'm going to, I'm going to hook you up with them just to see if you know Yay. about their work. So oh, this is great. You. I'm going to get connection. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, JJ, this has been wonderful. But before we go, I just want to ask, I, I like to ask people this question. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, okay. you know, because you've shared so much about your ethics, your work, some of your mentors and some of the, the professional things that you've done. And so we've got to learn a little bit more about you. What would be one thing that people who know you or are just learning about you would be surprised to learn about you? Well, a lot of people, uh, my close friends would know, but a lot of people don't realize that I will actually dress up as cartoon characters. I will dress up as comic book characters. So I cosplay, uh, costume play. Wow. Um, I started doing it while I was in California. I actually was out there doing it uh, for a number of different children's groups. And um, we had a group of kids that were dealing with cancer um, and they were in various stages of either treatment or recovery. And so seeing a superhero up close um, can sometimes make the difference in a child's day or a week or month that you wouldn't even imagine. Um, so I would dress up as Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy, or I dress up as my, my most recent was um, Doctor Who, the female Doctor Who. Yes. Uh, um, I love bringing them joy, you know, making them laugh. And so that's something that I've always been passionate about that a lot of people don't know about me, but I love wow. it. Wow. Well, I just learned that about you because I had no idea and I would have never guessed that. So... <laughs> Of course, everybody's going to know that I'm going to ask you this question, right? It's just predictable. Who's your favorite superhero character to dress up as? Oh, don't make me, don't make me pick. Okay, all right, I won't. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, if, I, if I had to, if I had to pick one, I'm only allowed to pick one, I would have to say the new Doctor Who that Jodie Whittaker is depicting. I have been just a, a big, big fan. Um, uh, and I've always been a big fan of all of the Doctor Who's. So... Um, if I'm only allowed to pick one, I, then that would be the one I would pick. That's, that's a great choice. And so if you're not familiar with Doctor Who, go watch it. Um, I'm, I still need to catch up on stuff, but it's a brilliant show. And she's incredible. So that's great. That's great. Okay. This has been just so wonderful, um, JJ. This is really, we've learned so much about you, about the Mentor Project, about the military, about what you do in your program. And we look forward to your work that you're going to do after you so-called retire, but when you transition to working on Africa next, and that's, uh, we're going to have you back again on the show. I know. Um, and this has been fabulous. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.
Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Big fan of your show and um, really excited to see how the Mentor Project grows in the future and how we can take smart innovation to make a real impact for our global community. Um, remember, everybody out there that's watching this, just a small action a day can make a much bigger impact than you could ever imagine. And you might not ever know that you were the one to start that chain, but go and do those little things because sometimes they turn into really big things. Thanks for having me, Susan. This was amazing. That was so great. It's great words of wisdom. And thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you next time on The Mentor Project. And again, uh, if you want to either become a mentor or see some of the wonderful mentors that are already up, go to mentorproject.org, mentorproject.org. And so we'll see you again next time. Thank you. I should point out, I'm not giving any worldwide talks right now. Um, wow. I'm here in the farm, like, you know, at home, like everyone else. I miss travel. Well, you're actually worldwide through this, right? You're Zooming everywhere. Well, that's true. That's, that's, that's true. It's not quite the same, but yeah. But people worldwide are getting still to be able to listen to you and cool. see you. So it's, it's great, right? And actually, cool. yeah. you're partly responsible for us being able to do this right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the firewall. Yep. So why don't we start there? And then we'll talk about okay. the farmhouse because I'm really interested in, tell us about your work with the firewall. Some people know what that means, but a lot of people don't that are watching. So let's start there. Well, okay. Um, I got to Bell Labs in 1987, the end of the year. And I had figured at that time, hmm, this internet seems to be a coming thing. I should learn something about it. Now, being sort of what we now call an IT guy, the, back then I was a system programmer, but it's sort of the same job. I looked around the labs and there was this thing, there was the firewall that Dave Prezado had built and there was email and the, the internet that was just starting. It, it was NSFNet and other things like that. Define, and I said, the define, way to learn this is... Define, yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Jeff. Define firewall. Some people do not even know what firewall... Okay. Is. I'll get to that in a moment. Great. Um, okay. But, but I figured I will start running this stuff so I can learn what's going on. And it turns out that's a right place at the right time sort of thing. Um, the firewall that, that Dave had and some other people had, I did not invent the firewall, um, was uh, it's something that lets you connect to the internet and lets the good stuff through and stops the bad stuff. Okay. Think of a guard at a building. It's a lot like that only really technical. And uh, this, uh, Dave had designed a firewall. He didn't trust anyone. Uh, you know, when the internet was first considered, everyone connected to everyone else. And uh, that wasn't such a great deal because frankly, the internet was and still is a bad neighborhood, mm. which means anyone could connect to you. So if you have a computer that can be attacked and you're on this original sort of wide open internet, Someone could attack you and ruin your day. And the idea was, let's stop those attacks from coming in, let you go out to the internet and do stuff, stop the stuff coming in. And uh, that's what his firewall did. I started making some changes to it and learning about it and so on. About a year later, the Morris worm hit. And this, the worm is like, it's a virus actually, a, a piece of software that reproduces and goes to different machines and invades it. And it had some bugs in it. 
And the problem with that sort of thing is it's exponential growth. And just like biological viruses, it can be too good at it. And what it would do would be keep reinfecting the same computers over and over again until they slowed down and stopped. So the internet all over the world was a mess, but it didn't get through our firewall. And I remember waking up that morning and someone had called and said, there's something wrong with the internet. And my first thought was, oh gosh, if it got through our firewall, I'm just going, to, I'm never going to hear the end of it. And I got into the labs and Dave, no, no, it was it, another researcher was on the phone saying, did you get it? We didn't get it. Neener, neener, neener. <laughs> and our firewall, mostly through design, had kept it out. There was one lucky part. Uh, about six months before, I had found something in our firewall. I said, I don't know what this service is, but it's running with privileges. And that means if there's something wrong with it, we could be hacked. And it was sort of the end of the day. And I said, screw it. I don't know what it is. I'll just turn it off. And that was one of the doors that the worm used to get in. So what I realized was that was security by being lucky. And I, it started forming my thoughts about security. And I've been studying security a lot ever since. And I redesigned the firewall um, with really tightening it up a lot, and maybe more than it needed to be, but that was good. And then, you know, I, I don't have a PhD, but a lot of people at the labs did. Mm -hmm. And they were writing papers for stuff. And so I wrote a paper on what I had done. And... Uh, it actually, my, my firewall had two, belt and suspenders. So if you got through one, you couldn't get through the second one. And there was one reviewer who said, well, you should just do 20 of them all together, stacked together. Anyway, I wrote a paper and I gave it to my boss, Fred Gramp, and he read it. He said, this is a good paper. All right. And I submitted it to a conference and they accepted it. And so I gave my first big paper in 1990. Um, and then I started playing with hackers. Uh, you know, if you've got a solid wall behind you, you can start asking questions. Who is out there and how are they trying to break in and what tools are they using? I can watch them. And so a, a bunch of us set up a variety of traps on the outside of the firewall, sort of like counting bugs on the windshield. You know, well, they might try to break in using this bug in this program. We'll put up something that looks like it's that program with that bug and have it report to us when things happen. And uh, some papers came out of that. And in particular, I actually, there was one hacker who, uh, from the Netherlands who was breaking in all over the place. And he started coming in there. And I had set up a special outside place that seemed like they were coming in and breaking into the machine and then attacking the rest of the world. What they were doing was coming into the machine under control. I was watching everything they did and so I could tell who they were attacking and how they were using it. It almost sounds so, like a computer. It sounds like a computer game, you know, like well, a lot of these. Well, uh, it very much is like that. Okay. They're called honey pots. Uh, they're very popular now. This was one of the early ones. Um, I there's a fellow named Cliff Stahl who originally did some work and wrote a great book about this, and he inspired me to say well, I should go look at this and do a little more advanced work. So I got to watch this guy for a while. Now, there are a couple problems. First of all, I know who he's ha attacking. So I could come in and, s and call those people and say, you're under attack. This machine has been broken into by this bad guy, and here's how he got in, and you might want to fix it. Okay, so that was all good. One of the places he tried to break in was U.S. Army, and they came and had a little chat with me. He said, your computer tried to attack us. I said, let me tell you what's going on here. You know, I had this, here's, here's what he did for attacking you, this is what I told you guys, and so on. Meanwhile, my management said, you know, our machine is technically attacking them, even though it's someone else. You've got to turn that off. So anyway, I had some fun toying with them and then shut it off, and I wrote up a paper. And it, I had called this hacker Burford. From I'm sorry, what, what's the name? You Burford. I am the white sheep of the family. My grandfather and father and brother and daughter and several cousins are all attorneys. So I'm the white sheep of the family. I'm the only one who, uh, who uh, actually does math for a living. Um, 
the uh, I come from an old Texas family. Uh, my family moved to Texas before the Republic of Texas was founded. We actually still have some of the land that was granted to the family for a performance during the uh, Revolutionary War of 1836. Um, I've also, therefore, I'm told I'm legally Hispanic because we gave up our U.S. citizenship and swore fealty to the King of Spain. And as a result, I think that legally makes me Hispanic. It doesn't matter. No one in my family has ever spoken Spanish. Wow. But anyway, my father and grandfather were very entrepreneurial. But they were not mechanically driven. But I always was interested in electronics. And I just so happened to grow up at the right place and the right time to see the growth of the early computing movement in the 1970s. And I got in on that. And I was able to get in more or less on the ground floor. And that allowed me to, to uh, be an entrepreneur and be a nerd at the same time. Now, I know for many kids and adolescents and even young adults, sometimes they feel pressure from their families to follow in their family's footsteps, yet they have a passion for something else. So when you look back on what um, enabled you to stick to your interest, even though other people were doing different things, were people very supportive of you from, from the beginning or did they try to push you towards things that they were doing? I got a little bit of both push and pull. My parents were absolutely terrified at the idea of my not, of my taking a technical lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> they wanted me very much to get a degree in business. They ultimately just, uh, insisted that I go to a university that was not at the time the right university for me to go to. As a result, I never ended up with a college degree. And it wasn't, um, was it not the right um, one because it wasn't what you were interested in? Was it, was it more in the business-oriented type of uh, college? I, I went to the University of Texas at a time when it was, it was and still is a world-class institution. But the particular degree that I was seeking was, at that time, not one that was good at the university. Today, it is world-class. But as a result, I ended up trying to cut across different departments to get the information that I needed. And I ended up not doing very well as a result, trying to cobble together an education. Um, <clears throat> I knew what I needed to know, and they weren't interested in letting me learn it. They wanted me to follow their rules. Well, yeah, when, I'm sorry. And when you say what you wanted to know, that was regarding what you wanted to go into, not in terms of the business. Yes. You were following your passion. Yes, I was following my passion, and I wanted a, a well-rounded education in the concepts of computation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was consulting as early as my sophomore year in college in the middle of the oil boom in the late 70s, and early 80s. Um, I actually had a client that was in Houston while I was living in Austin. And the client wanted me in Houston so badly, they called me up and told me that they have just chartered a 747 and that I was to meet it at the Austin airport and to fly into, uh, into Houston. My reply was, first of all, I'm fat, but I'm not that fat. I don't need a 747 all to myself. And secondly of all, I didn't think you could land the 747 at Austin's municipal airport, which is not the airport they have today. And it turned out they couldn't. So I never saw the plane. I don't know if they actually, they, they may have been completely making it up, but I doubt it. That was the era of the oil boom when they were doing completely crazy things in Houston. But um, I was caught between a, a university that, had, that wanted to teach me how to design uh, power plants and uh, stereo uh, radios. And uh, I wanted to learn how to design the meanest, nastiest, fastest, cheapest computers in the world. What got you interested in the computers? Do you remember? Like, what, what, do you remember the moment where you're like, I, I'm interested in computers. I'm interested in, in inventing something or adding something to what's already out there. Well, I loved to tinker as a child, but my, my father, who was quite an entrepreneur himself, had introduced me to heavy equipment as a small child. 
the business that my father had that made the most money most of the time was a wholesale lumber company. But we also had ranches between. So there was bulldozers and tr- and trucks and forklifts and things. And we would uh, he would take me as a child out of school and I would ride with him all over Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana on various adventures. And I climbed around equipment that it would absolutely terrify people today. And this was before the days of OSHA. These machines, well, they were man killers. And um, I fell in love with the various things. But the big thing I realized was that trucks needed some help. And so I came up with an idea for a way to improve the driving of trucks, but it required a design So, like, when you, as early as you can remember, did you grow up wanting to be a doctor? Like, what was your, when you were, like, a young boy, um, what did you want to do when you grew up? Well, yeah, certainly I I didn't grow up wanting to be a doctor. I mean, I went through the stages. I, I think um, uh, uh, super Superhero was one of the, the stages, and then, um, you know, Space Traveler, and at some point, I, you know, uh, wanted to be, uh, you know, you go through all these little steps where, oh, you want to be like a star athlete. You want to be, uh, because I played a lot of sports uh, when growing up. Um, uh, and then it ranged between like uh, fictional characters and science fiction characters. When I, But then eventually I realized, well, okay, maybe that's not possible to be some of those fictional characters. Um, Which but, one was your favorite? Who, who was your, some of your favorite characters? Well, it's interesting because it's funny. I, I, um, I read, so one of the things I did was I read a lot of comic books. Um, so I, uh, uh, you know, the, the Avengers was actually one of the comic books that I read quite, uh, quite seriously when I was a kid. So it's interesting seeing that the Avengers movies are so popular now because at the time, you know, not everyone knew what they were. Um, so there were, there were those of us who, who, who read those types of comic books and now to actually see it uh, in an X-Men and, um, you know, I read like a, uh, Batman and Superman and all those things like that. Uh, and then I was also into, um, science fiction stuff so uh certainly like different types of monster movies and and um and star trek uh star wars those type of things um and then i also was interested as i mentioned uh sports uh so i grew up playing tennis and 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 soccer and also played played a lot of other sports as well so i also was uh you know had um a lot of athletes that i uh followed and was interested in um emulating at least on the, on the court and on the, um, on the field. Um, so I, and I also did a lot of, uh, uh, building of things. So I had my Lego sets and so I would build these big cities. So, so part of me also wanted to, uh, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm in New York city now and I used to really, well, I still do. I re- used to really love the subway system. So I would build Lego versions of the New York city subway system. Wow, that's really fascinating. So when you were a kid, did you, you were on the New York City subway system or did you not, were you actually a, a passenger and then you would go home and build it through your Lego system? Yeah, I would go up to uh, New York City regularly in the summer. Uh, one of the things I would do is I would go up to, to watch the U.S. Open uh, because, you know, again, I was interested in tennis. So, uh, and then I also spent a fair amount of time kind of wandering around Manhattan and, and certainly, of course, Flushing Meadow, et cetera. And I used to ride the subway. I said, like, this is really cool. I, I, I love the- Finding success and achievement. And I think that is so important because oftentimes we believe that success looks like a perfect path. Um, And if we could draw it as a line, it would look like a straight line that goes up and to the right. And the reality is that that is not what success looks like at all. And in fact, if you were to talk to the people that are most successful in the world and they really shared their stories with you, it was not a straight line that went up and to the right. Um, They would tell you that there were really tough times. They would tell you that there were probably times they weren't sure of themselves or that they had chosen the right path or that they were going to be able to keep going or that they would succeed. 
they would tell you that they made mistakes. And it, they would tell you that the times they made mistakes were probably some of the most valuable moments in their life because they learned the most from it. And so what I think is important is to understand that you're going to miss the mark sometimes. And the path is not going to be perfect. Sometimes you'll get a little bit off path or you'll deviate from that path and create a new path altogether. That's all natural and it's all normal. And it doesn't mean that you're not successful. It is a part of life. And what is most important is that you take those moments and those lessons and you figure out how to learn from them and how to keep going, especially when going gets tough. Uh, it is that point where you just can't quit. You've got to decide that you're going to keep going and know that whatever that tough point is, um, and, and, and you might have, you're going to have some rough patches, but whatever that is, you can keep going and it will not last forever. You will outlast that tough patch. But the most important thing is that you learn from it and you grow from it because that learning and that growth and some of the tough parts and what I call the valleys of that squiggly line are going to propel you to the heights and the mountaintops of that squiggly line. So that's another point that I think is really, really important to know. I think the third point uh, that, it, that is really, really important um, and has certainly been part of um, what I talk to a lot of people about is to understand that you are a unique person. You, there is no one else who is like you in this entire world. And because of that, that means that you have a certain set of gifts, a certain set of talents. And I believe that we each have gifts and talents that the world needs in some way. And so what becomes important is that you remember that and that you carry that. And that as you figure out and you make your way through your squiggly line, um, that you figure out how to use those talents and those gifts. And the things that you will have at most joy in doing and ultimately likely be the most successful and feel the most fulfilled doing are likely to be things that are using those unique talents and gifts. And what do I mean by talents and gifts? I mean, there are things that come to you so easily that don't come to other people really easily or as naturally. So maybe you can solve certain math equations really quickly, whereas other people are like, wow, how did you do that?